The ability of voters to lobby their elected representatives is a critical part of government. It helps keep politicians informed and in touch with public opinion, as well as making them aware of the consequences of their policy making. But to many observers, lobbying all too often skews policies towards wealthy special interests with friends in high places, and the close relationship between government regulators and the industries they monitor frequently leads to regulatory capture, in which regulators go easy on private companies and even effectively act as lobbyists for their interests. Regulatory capture was widely seen as one of the causes of the financial crisis. So does lobbying lead to economically inefficient policies? And what should be done to prevent regulatory capture? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Capital Ideas at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Marianne Bertrand is the Chris P. Dialinas Professor of Economics at Chicago Booth. She's a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, as well as at the Center for Economic Policy Research and the Institute for the Study of Labor, and she's a co-editor of the American Economic Review. A co-director of Chicago Booth's Social Enterprise Initiative, she won the 2012 Society of Labor Economists Rosen Prize for outstanding contributions to labor economics. Luigi Zingales is the Robert C. McCormack Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance and the David G. Booth Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. He's president-elect of the American Finance Association and the author of the books Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists and A Capitalism for the People. He also wrote Preventing Economists' Capture, a chapter for Daniel Carpenter and David Moss's recent book Preventing Regulatory Capture, Special Interest Influence and How to Limit It. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. I want to start by sort of defining what we're talking about and some of the advantages and disadvantages. Luisa Zingales, what, what, what are the broadly, what are the dangers of lobbying and, and regulatory capture? So first of all, we need to understand that uh, petition the government to redress of uh, grievances is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. So it's part of what freedom is about. However, I think that over the years, lobbying has moved from getting the government off your back to getting the government in your pockets. And I think that uh, this uh, uh, sort of evolution that is an in involution, if you want, uh, is very dangerous and is not fully appreciated. So a lot of uh, libertarians, for example, see lobbying as something good and don't understand that it's actually um, something that can destroy the very functioning of our economy. Because uh, as the return for lobbying goes up and you have opportunities, more and more people dedicate resources to that rather than to produce. I think that uh, lobbying has become the highest return activity in this country. And uh, not surprisingly, Washington has become incredibly rich. And so since the old days, Washington was like a provincial town with not much entertainment. Today is one of the most uh, uh, wealthy part of the nation. And we know nothing is produced in Washington except laws. So all this wealth is just rent seeking. Okay, Mariam Bertrand? Yeah, I mean, I think going back to this point, I very much agree with, you know, kind of with Reggie. I mean, at the core is the First Amendment and the idea that, you know, we can petition our government. I think the, the key issue in my mind is, in a sense, that not everyone has got the ability to petition the government as well as, you know, as others. And issues of organization and resources are going to be very important. To be able to petition the government, you need to be organized, you need to have resources. And that really creates some core kind of asymmetries. You know, some voices are heard and other voices have a much more difficult time being heard. So do you think it exacerbates the kind of haves and the have-nots? Uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, kind of if you think about, you know, a given issue where, you know, kind of you'd like to hear from, you know, business, you'd like to hear from unions, and, you know, but also citizens, taxpayers kind of, you know, should also, you know, have their voice. Unfortunately, the citizens and taxpayers, because of traditional kind of free riding prompts, just are not going to go and fly to D.C. to say, this is my opinion on this, but, you know, companies and unions will have a much easier time kind of doing that. And I, I think that, you know, that, that is really, I think, the core of a problem from, from my perspective. So it really goes back to, you know, kind of all theories about interest groups and kind of what makes some groups more organized than others. Is it all bad, Luigi Zingales? No, it's not all bad, but I think it's getting worse. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, as I said, lobbying has learned by doing. I think that uh, in the old days, partly also for an ideological restriction, you didn't have so much influence of business in Washington. Today, uh, both political parties are very open and they actually compete to be friendly with business. And uh, the result is that is sort of a, a competition to the who is more prone to business wishes. And uh, as Mayan was saying, the interest of uh, society at large, of consumers, uh, 
is the taxpayers is not really well represented. So I had one thing. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, kind of, Richie says it's getting worse over time. I guess I'm not sure where, where the evidence is for that. I mean, what, what, I, what, I, you know, what, I, what I think is true about, you know, the U.S., at least that we've made progress in terms of, like, disclosing lobbying. So I think there was, you know, a major change in 1995, which was Lobbying Disclosure Act, which at least made the process somewhat, and you know, we can go back to that, somewhat transparent. So that we know since, you know, the late 1990s, you know, who is spending money kind of lobbying. We did not know that before. So we have no sense as to what the situation was like prior to, you know, the late 1990s. We know since the data is available that the amount spent on lobbying is essentially kind of doubled. It's gone to 1.5 billion to like 3 billion uh, a year today. But it's, I, I think it's hard to point at the evidence that sort of things have gotten, you know, have gotten worse. We can go back to Citizens United, maybe that'll be another topic, and that's, you know, that, that's something somewhat different. But I don't know, wh wh where, you know, kind of where do you see the evidence of things getting worse over time? I think that the, the number of uh, uh, lobbying organizations uh, has been going up. The registered lobbying watchman has gone up. As you said, the amount of lobbying has gone up. Uh, the amount of targeted uh, law, what is called like pork barrel, has gone up. Um, and I think it's also a, a feeling over all the country. And it's just that one of the things that shocked me the most is that in, in 2009, some students uh, who were trying to sort of start a company approached me and uh, I didn't understand why they approached me, and at the end of the day, they approached me because they wanted to lobby the government to get some top money for their enter uh, enterprise. So the idea that even sort of startup companies think about lobbying before the, they have a defined business plan is pretty scary. Now, on the other hand, I think the evidence that lobbying is effective is much less clear, right? So there's been a lot of studies that typically take the form of looking at voting behavior by congressmen on a set of issues. And because the data is available, we essentially kind of know which specific congressman gets money from, you know, from whom or is being lobbied by, you know, by, by special interests. And, you know, some studies would find that this lobbying kind of seemed to affect the way these congressmen, congressmen vote, but I think as many, uh, as many studies don't seem to find an effect. So I think the evidence on, you know, lobbying has an impact on voting behavior is, you know, is not, I don't think, so, uh, so overwhelming. No, I'll caveat that myself. I think a lot of what lobbying does is essentially kind of preventing things from even being discussed in Congress, stopping things, you know, in committees and subcommittees. And that obviously cannot be studied because there's never a vote that's associated with it. But I think, you know, I think research, I think so far, you know, somewhat limited by the data, as I just mentioned, I don't think has been so overwhelming kind of mentioning or finding that, uh, that lobbying is, you know, is effective. We know that companies are spending more and more in lobbying, so unless they're completely yeah. stupid... No, the other hand, one could take, you know, here's, you know, no, you could before, you know, so, some people have actually kind of reversed the argument, is that if you think about the $3 billion that's spent in lobbying, that is peanuts compared to, like, the amount of money that is at stake, right? Yeah. Some people have said the small amount spent on lobbying, you know, same point has been made about, you know, PACs, about kind of company contributions by companies, by company contributions, that those, you know, kind of very few companies, I think 5% of companies are the max in terms of, like, how much they can spend directly on campaigns. And all that would say, again, given how much is at stake, then maybe, you know, maybe it's not working so well. So, again, I can reverse that argument and say maybe you don't actually need to spend that much money to influence you know, to influence congressmen, that might be true. But I think the verdict is, you know, I think the jury is still out on, you know, on that Yeah, one. but the, the Gordon Taluk argument that there is too little mm -hmm. money in politics, I think that... Uh, just, ex just explain what you're talking about there. So, uh, Gordon Taluk, this was in 1972. It was, a, a, I think, a brilliant idea. He looks at sort of the overall amount of money that the government allocates. So, I redid this calculation in 2008, and the, the argument is still true in 2008. And basically, think about, in 2008, the government was spending... Uh, what, well, like roughly $5 trillion, of which uh, uh, one trillion was in, in sort of uh, uh, non-discretionary spending, like interest and retirement benefits, so you can't sort of influence that much. So think about $4 trillion. Uh, and uh, if you buy every congressman and, every, and the president, so you, you basically spend all the money in the extra campaign. 2008, I think the total amount was like $5 billion. So with $5 billion, you get to control a flow of four trillion, at least for two years, probably for more, but at least for two years. So basically, you have a return of uh, one to what more than a thousand. Okay. So uh, now, of course, not all the money spent is is profits. You can, but even if you do all this adjustment, you see that the return to investment in lobbying is potentially very very high. And you're talking there about lobbying on particular issues, because no, so no, this is like it is how much money is spent 
to quote unquote buy Congress, it's including donations to campaigns. Yeah, yes. Yes. the classical example was the agricultural subsidies. I think that's the one that Tolak used at the time. And yeah. you know, so much money is associated with them that you know you get you know returns on investment are just you know incredibly high. If you really believe there's a causal link between. Uh, between the lobbying or the campaign contributions, you know, and uh, and the outcome. Yeah, but the there, are, there are a lot of studies. So there is one study showing, for example, uh, remember the 2004 law where they allowed a repatriation of foreign uh, profits for companies at the reduced tax rates. Uh, you see that uh, the total amount of lobbying for that particular event was of the order of 200 million, and uh, they save like 56 billion in taxes. So. If you, again, if you take the ratio, you see that the return to lobbying is disproportionate. And I think that uh, part of the answer is what Marianne was saying, is that one side is so rich that doesn't need to spend all that money. And it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, there is a lottery and the price is, is big enough uh, that if you buy all the tickets, you make money, but you don't need to pay the full amount if some people are liquidity constrained. And I think that that's part of the, the world we're in. But I think ideology creates a, a restriction to that because some people, uh, believe it or not, are not up for sales. And so that creates sort of a, some, some uh, restriction. Uh, but I think that Gordon Tallack was very insightful because he foresaw in 1972 the pattern and the pattern is increasing and, and companies figure out more and more. And there are a lot of lobbies that, that said, oh, we taught companies how to use this more effectively. And, uh, and they are doing it. So... So is, it, is increasing money necessarily a bad thing? I mean, if we think about the idea of a, of a marketplace of ideas, you could imagine that more money was being spent, but more good ideas were coming forward and the best ideas were rising to the top. Why, why shouldn't that be happening? But for two reasons. First of all, if you take this to the extreme, why don't we put congressmen, congressmen up for auction and we pay with money? So uh, we don't think that in the political market you want to play with money. Why? Because is not a market in a traditional form. This is something that goes back to Milton Friedman, that the difference is that when I decide to buy which type of tie, I don't really have an impact on uh, everybody else. When I vote in a certain way, I impact the final outcome because there is a public decision. And it's a kind of a winner-take-all market. So uh, there is, and again, Gordon Tallock's show it was, I think, the first to show that there is no guarantee that the amount of investment that people make in this game is efficient. In fact, can be either underinvest or overinvest uh, because because of the nature of the game. So it is a market where sort of uh, uh, non-control competition leads to bad outcome, and that's the reason why we need regulation. One of the reasons that that that, uh, that the constitution protects the right to, to lobby government is because of this flow of information, isn't it? The people who are actually affected by the legislation get to say how they're going to be affected and their concerns, uh, et cetera. Now, Marianne, you've actually done research that speaks directly to this informational aspect of lobbying. Tell us yeah, about what I, you I mean, I think it, it is really that, you know, kind of that big question is that one would like to know, go beyond just saying lobbying happens, to try to understand kind of what happens within the lobbying process and what, you know, is it really a process of like exchanging information with congressmen? And, and I think one could make the argument that, that that could be really kind of useful with, you know, with the caveats of, uh, you know, kind of that, that we kind of just raised is that, you know, kind of think about congressmen, essentially I've, as having to be on top of like many, many different fields that, you know, kind of that they know nothing about and that lobbying could actually be a very useful process of informing them about, uh, about issues and helping them think through the consequences of voting one way versus the other. And, you know, kind of and there's the other view of lobbying, which is actually has got nothing to do with information. Essentially, kind of, um, I will help you out with your campaign, I'll help you kind of raise vote and, you know, kind of without the explicit quid pro quo, you know, because that's clearly is illegal. But if, you know, I'll help you out, uh, you vote, uh, you know, you vote the way that is, you know, in favor of mine. So, so what we've been trying in one research project to try to open that box of, you know, of a lobbying process and trying to answer kind of what do, you know, kind of what do lobbyists uh, actually do. And um, so, so we have one research paper that essentially kind of starts with trying to um, make relationships between, you know, kind of uh, establish relationships, personal relationships between congressmen and lobbyists, you know, which, you know, which we can, you know, proxy for pretty well. So who knows whom, essentially, kind of personally, who is friend with whom. And, uh, and because of this lobbying data that is now kind of available, uh, it's also possible to try to kind of categorize lobbyists in terms of their expertise. So this is someone that essentially kind of works on health issues. This is someone that works more on, uh, on military issues. And in, what we do in, the, in this paper is try to, in sense, kind of document 
which lobbyists are, you know, kind of the best paid, you know, are the best paid lobbyists those that actually know something, have information that could be valuable to the congressman, or they're the one that know people. And our research really seems to kind of find that, you know, the premium that lobbyists kind of get you know, kind of receive is really tied to their connections more than their expertise. In fact, there's one finding in, in, in that research project that I find kind of particularly interesting, which is we look at, you know, kind of lobbyists that have a relationship with a given congressman and look at whether these lobbyists actually change committee assignments as those congressmen change policy assignments. So you've got Congressman X, he used to cover health care and now he's moving to military issues. And what we find essentially is that the lobbies that are connected to that congressman follow the congressman as he switch from one committee to the next. So what determines kind of what, con what lobbyists work on is not what they know, if you believe that test, but in fact who they know. Which I think kind of tells us something about the fact that what makes lobby lobbyists special is the connections rather than the expertise. Now I'll, I'll caveat this with the fact that we, you know, behind a given lobbyist, there might be a whole, you know, whole company, you know, a K-street firm that is made of experts, and those experts may give that lobbyist some information that he's going to go and, you know, kind of communicate to the congressman, so that we cannot really observe. But the lobbyist per se, the one that I registered, you know, kind of in those, uh, uh, you know, in the Senate kind of, uh, in the Senate office, the lobbyists per se seem to be, you know, kind of more valuable for who they know than uh, than the expertise. There's another kind of great paper that's kind of related to ours that looks at the premium that lobbyists that are ex-staffers, so they were, you know, as, you know, we may talk about this later, but there's revolving doors, so lots of lobbyists, you know, started their career, in fact, working, you know, uh, as congressional staff. And, you know, in that paper, they look at the premium that these ex-staffers lobbyists get and how that premium changes when the congressman they are connected to um, retires or leave office. And what they find is just really striking drop in how much business those ex-staffers get when they contact in Congress kind of, you know, disappear. Same point. I mean, I think the connections are, you know, are really central and it's much harder to find direct evidence that, you know, lobbies are special because of what they know. So the idea being who you know is more important than, than what you have to... Certainly what, the research. I think both of those kind of pieces of research go very strongly in that direction. Okay, and the, the, when we turn to regulation, the, the, the mirror of that is regulatory capture, this concern about regulators going easy on companies because there's this revolving door of, of jobs back and forth. Did, was that one of the causes of the financial crisis, Luigi Zingales? I think it was a contributing factor to the financial crisis. And it says, uh, there is no question that uh, uh, some regulation was very light uh, and uh, that especially some subgroups, for example, investment banks, uh, they lobby hard to be regulated by the SEC, who basically did nothing to supervise them. And uh, we know there was a lot of uh, uh, sort but you're of attributing, shopping. You're attributing that to regulatory capture rather than understaffing or incompetence or anything else? Uh, I think that uh, it was pretty clear that investment bankers wanted to be regulated by the SEC. And so uh, I think that they but, I mean, knew the SEC that it was more failed, friendly. failed to spot Bernie Madoff, even though they were <laughs> warned about it. That, that wasn't an example of regulatory capture. Um, I think that uh, certainly there was also some incompetence. There's no question about it. But uh, I think that the combination of the two was pretty deadly. So now allocating the, the blame between the two is, is sort of uh, hard. But... Uh, uh, I think both contributed for sure. So, in the in the uh, legal response that we've had to to the financial crisis, have we dealt at all with this question, or has it been brushed aside? I think it's been brushed aside. And this is first of all, I think much of the regulation, Dodd Frank, was to re-regulate the sector that was regulated, and the shadow banking sector was basically left left uh, untouched in the process. So uh, that's that's problem number one. Problem number two, I think that. Uh, there is not enough understanding, in my view, of how uh, the industry creates a culture that is in a certain way. So I think that uh, uh, we heavily rely on uh, um, ex experts, but we need to be afraid that experts tend naturally to be pro-industry. In sense, if you are an expert in nuclear power, it's very hard that you are sort of anti-nuclear power. Uh, is sort of your human capital is so invested in that sector that you are predisposed to see the, the, the positive more than the benefit. And uh, one thing that actually struck me about uh, England is when they created a sort of a commission to analyze the, the financial problems, they put there a couple of people who were not expert in the industry. They were very smart people, 
uh, but not expert in the industry to provide a balance. And I think we need to think more strategically in that direction. Um, and uh, when uh, Sabanoxy was approved, I don't know whether it was done on purpose but, or coincidence, but uh, when they created the board of the PCOB, uh, for full disclosure, I'm a consultant of the PCOB, but they went created the, uh, the, the board. That's the, that's the accounting uh, regulator. Yes, they required that three out of five of the board members are known accountants. And I think that's an excellent idea. I think we should see more of this along the way. And I'm not aware that uh, Dodd Frank did anything in that direction. I think in the same spirit, in terms of like kind of changes, I think anything, so, you know, we talked very early on about, you know, kind of the, the very different kind of numbers of voices you hear kind of, you know, in Washington coming from business versus coming from, you know, kind of say, you know, kind of uh, public interest groups like, you know, NGOs, organizations that may have a view, for example, you know, on nuclear power or on climate change. And that, that is, I think, a reflection of the different kind of resources that these kind of organizations have. So I think kind of when I think about kind of changes that may help the process, I think anything that would kind of empower, financially empower some of these organizations to also have a voice. I mean, we cannot get rid of the First you Amendment. Mean even, you mean even more lobbying? Well, I mean, I think we, can, we cannot get rid of the First Amendment. So I, I have a hard time thinking that there will be a time in the U.S. where, you know, kind of we will break down the idea that you can talk to a congressman. But, you know, so yes, I think in a sense, kind of even more, 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 more lobbying so to that... To level the playing field. So, yeah, I think the EU actually has that in place, as I understand it. I've never seen any kind of numbers, but... I understand that the EU is a process where they actually subsidize, you know, some of these, you know, some of these NGOs that may have a say, you know, on a given matter. And they, they view it, I think, particularly important in their context, because even if we think that our congressmen don't know much and are understaffed and don't have the ability to understand problems, I think in Europe that's even, that's even more of a concern. So I think that's why they have this process in place. I think something like that, which is, you know, in sense, even more lobbying to solve the problems of lobbying might not be, uh, might be a practical be a practical solution. Taxpayer-funded lobbying is going to be a hard sell in the United States. Uh, Luigi Zingales, though, I wanted to ask you about uh, something you've written about, the idea that uh, academics, economists, uh, could be uh, subject to a kind of a form of, of capture. They need to get data for their research. Journalists need to get sources for their stories. Um, and these, these are the, exactly the kind of sources that, that politicians use to, to inform their debate. Is that a kind of broader danger of, of capture? Yeah, I think it is a broader danger. Uh, especially, I think, in business school, because uh, by definition, we study business and we need to interact with business. So I think that uh, uh, we cannot avoid a problem by being separate, uh, because that will really kill our very sort of uh, profession and, and uh, activity. But we need to be very much aware of that. And uh, uh, I think disclosure is a very important step. But also, I think a more intense competition uh, uh, with similar access to data. I think that uh, uh, m one of my sort of uh, pet obsession is that I would like to have data more publicly released uh, so that a lot of people can use them and, and debate them. Because it is true, think about in the medical profession, it is true that the tobacco industry this sort of uses a huge amount of money trying to convince uh, that smoking was not bad for you. They fail. So uh, it took sort of 20 years for people to realize, but they fail. So I think that uh, I'm not hopeless. That's part of the reason why I'm in academia. I'm not hopeless about the role of academia. I think that uh, uh, when the data overwhelmingly in one direction, it's very difficult to get somebody to sort of say something else. Uh, but it takes time and discipline because the, the debate, looking sort of uh, in the past, the debate on smoking was very much distorted by money in the industry. Uh, and uh, we discover uh, publicly the damage of smoking and secondhand smoking later with respect to what it would have been optimal. So I think we have to be very much aware. And uh, uh, this is not a problem just for economists, it's for every academics. But as I said, economists, because they deal with uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, important interests, they're particularly exposed. And business professors like we are, are particularly exposed. So I think that the, the best recipe, in my view, is self-awareness. And I, I mean, I told you, so as, as an editor of a journal, I think this has been you know, a great push over the last few years is to have kind of more disclosure, you know, kind of, you know, if you are going to go and study, you know, a certain industry and kind of write a paper on that, that you have to disclose any kind of relationship we have with, you know, kind of the 
the firm that has been, you know, that has been providing data. And on the issue of like data access and replication, I think that's also very, very central, but sometimes quite difficult because, you know, you get into a relationship with a company, you get data, and part of that relationship is that you're not going to share this data with anybody else. So that really limits the extent to which one, you know, kind of one can do this kind of replication exercise that Luigi is talking about. But I think this is key. I think the transparency and the disclosures are, you know, are really, really important. And you think that's a model that might be able to be reproduced in, in government? Yeah, and I think that uh, the capture in the academic profession is not just by business, but also by government organization. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to totally second that. So you may not have liked my idea of like uh, taxpayers subsidizing more lobbying, but in terms of other change, which I think are really doable, is that I think the Lobbying Disclosure Act did not go far enough. You know, the data is quite rich. I can see that a given company spent a given amount of money on, you know, lobbying a certain committee. But one could actually kind of push this further and basically kind of require that, you know, any kind of conversation between a lobbyist and a congressman, um, you know, there's transcripts associated with them. So maybe the, those transcripts are not made available immediately for the reason that Luigi mentioned. But like five years later, all this becomes kind of available in the public domain. I think that would be tremendously uh, useful in, you know, kind of controlling kind of behaviors. I mean, not be behaviors well, you want to see. So, and I think that's doable. Okay. It's, but the problem is that we're going to have to get that passed into <laughs> a law, and then we are dealing with lobbying. We can guarantee we'll get some lobbying against, against any this such is, proposal. Absolutely. Yeah, but I'm actually more hopeful because I think that nobody likes this system. It's kind of a rat race that uh, uh, most companies uh, dislike the system, and most congressmen dislike the system. It's just saying, they are that doing, I have to do it myself. And so if you find a way to stop it, a credible way to stop it, they might sort of uh, come along. But I'm not sure, I, I think I tend to disagree with that because of what I said earlier. I think, you know, the, I think that it is not even, I think some people have got more voice than, than others and like, you know, like the system because, you know, because of that. Yeah, I, I think that some companies definitely prefer it. But I'm saying if you take, uh, if most congressmen, I don't think they like the system. Yeah. And, and they are very much afraid now of that system because the latest sort of uh, result of uh, the Citizens United is that even the potential that of was, attacking... Let's just explain. That was the 2010 decision by the Supreme Court that basically had unlimited donations were allowed. Independent, independent expenditures. Independent. So there's, there's, there's still the same constraints on direct expenditures to a campaign, but essentially you can... You know, before, individuals could spend as much as they wanted on, you know, ads on TV saying, I love this guy or I hate this guy. And since it's in the United States, essentially companies and uh, unions can also do that as well. And, and, and many sort of super PAC use this strategically by basically attacking at the last minute, just before the election, somebody who has positions that they don't like. And so just the threat of a huge amount of money coming into your district and wiping out your advantage is enough for people to behave. So they don't even need to spend the money. It's just the threat of the money that does the job. And that's the reason why certain issues are never discussed. They're not confronted because, uh, and this is bipartisan. It's not just a Republican or Democratic issue. Not, none of the, of the two wants to touch them. And it changes, I think it changes congressmen as well because they are so dependent on the money that they pay interest to issues that, so from a societal perspective, are not going to be the most important one. I go back to my climate change example, because there's maybe not as much money associated with that, but there's lots more money associated with, like, you know, the pet problem of a given company that could be solved through, you know, a new regulation or the undoing of an existing regulation. And many, many of these problems come back to money. We're all from Europe. There's much less money in, in politics in Europe. Are things better there? I think it's both better and worse. It is definitely the case that there is less money. And so it's easier for you to get elected without uh, selling your soul to some vested interest. Um, however, there are two aspects which are more negative. One, in many countries, you have uh, uh, financing from the government, which tends to favor enormously the incumbent vis-a-vis -vis the new challenger. So it's less easy to sort of have a change of ideas. And in many cases, sort of there is an ideology that makes lobbying not even an issue. In the sense, uh, the idea of the national champions uh, in Europe, uh, if you are France or Italy or Germany, you are protecting your national champion against the other Europeans. And, and as a result, uh, this is completely accepted and there is a full integration be be between uh, the, the lobbies of the firm and uh, the, the congressmen. 
So I agree. I think better and worse. From, from, from a given perspective, I think there's less money in, you know, kind of political process in Europe. And I think that's, a, you know, that's a good thing because as we discussed, that's kind of part of the problem. You know, on the other hand, for example, you take the EU, the kind of this, the, the, the registry I was mentioning before of like lobbyists and who's spending, you know, kind of how much on what, that is not even like mandatory in, you know, in the EU. So there's much less transparency, in fact, in the EU than there is in the US. Okay. Well, on that note, we are uh, out of time. My, my thanks to our panel, Marianne Bertrand and Luigi Zingales. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at chicagobooth.edu slash capideas. Join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye.